Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Spring Human Rights Lecture. I'm Elora Chaudhry uh, from the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and also the Director of the Human Rights Minor. Um, I just wanted to note that we are hosting the lecture today in the Advanced Topics in Human Rights course. So a very special welcome to the students in the class, as well as friends who have joined us um, across the university and actually also from out of state. Thank you for being here. Um, I also want to thank the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, uh, the Honors College and the Asian Studies Department for co-sponsoring the event with us and a warm welcome and gratitude to uh, folks who are joining us today from these departments. Uh, also, a very special thanks to B. Downey, our department manager, and Olivia Valiani, our um, WGS student, who's helping today to coordinate the event. So it's uh, such a pleasure to welcome Dr. Shanila Kojamulji today. She is an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at Bowdoin College, Maine. Um, Dr. Koja Mulji is an interdisciplinary scholar working at the intersections of feminist theory, cultural studies, and critical Muslim studies. Her research interests include Muslim girlhood, masculinities, sovereignty, and Ismaili Muslim women's history. And she investigates these topics empirically in relation to Muslim communities in Pakistan, the United States, and Canada. Dr. Koja Mulji is um, author of numerous books. Uh, her first book, uh, which is the recipient of uh, two awards, is titled Forging the Ideal Educated Girl, the Production of Desirable Subjects in Muslim South Asia. Um, in this book, she combines historical and cultural studies analysis with ethnographic work to examine the figure of the educated girl in colonial India and post-colonial Pakistan. Her forthcoming book um, out later this year is titled Sovereign Attachments, Masculinity, Muslimness, and Affective Politics in Pakistan. Uh, Professor Kojamulji is currently working on a third book project that traces the transnational lives of displaced Muslim women. The book follows their journeys past and present from colonial India to East Africa, and then on to North America. And it outlines the everyday forms through which women create spaces of joy, forge community and practice ethical subjectivities. So um, without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Kojamulji, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to begin by thanking Professor Elora Chaudhary and the Human Rights Minor for creating the space, for inviting me um, so we can have some critical conversations about human rights. Um, I also see um, students and faculty from Bowdoin, so I wanted to say hi and to say thank you to them for coming. Um, I also see members from the Ismaili Muslim community, so yadi madat to them and welcome to them as well. Um, let me share my slides. Okay, I think you can see the slides, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so in the time that we have together, um, I will call on us to critically analyze the assumptions that inform the human rights discourse um, and consider whether the discourse allows us to explain all forms of sociabilities and imaginations of a good life that we observe around us. And if not, then what might be um, some ways in which we can start exploring additional vocabularies of justice and human dignity. And so in the talk, um, I hope to simultaneously acknowledge the contribution that the human rights discourse makes in advancing our imagination of what it means to be a fully human subject. But at the same time, I also um, wanted to critique its hegemony and its colonizing effects and draw attention to that. Specifically, the questions that animate me are, what assumptions about human relationality, empowerment, good life, and rights inform the normative human rights discourse? 
What are its geopolitical and historical specificities? What kinds of lived experiences evade capture by the discourse? And how might we decolonize it then to account for this multiplicity? Um, much of what I will explore today um, comes from my um, decade-long fieldwork in southern Pakistan with specifically Shia Ismaili Muslims. Um, I want to begin by telling a story. The year is 2010. I am a bright-eyed master's student at Columbia University focusing on international educational development, um, perhaps like many of you here. Um, I have newly discovered the field of human rights education and I'm moved by its promise to empower girls, particularly girls from Pakistan, where I'm from. Um, the image that you see on the slide is the apartment building where I grew up and the red sort of circle, it circles the apartment, um, the specific apartment, it no longer belongs to me, um, but that's where I grew up. Um, so it's a spring semester and another grad student who is also a Pakistani and I, um, ponder over what we should do over summer. We decided that we should create a human rights summer camp for girls in Pakistan so that we can share our newfound knowledges with them and in doing so, empower them. We apply for funding and really it was a surprise for us that we actually got this, we received funding. Um, later on when we, um, years later when we applied for funding for different types of projects and kept getting rejected, um, we reminisced and speculated that perhaps we got the funding the first time because we were obsessed with rescuing Muslim women out there, um, but who knows. We um, get to Pakistan um, and implement this camp we call it Women Leaders for Tomorrow. The camp is hugely successful in terms of attendance. Um, we have almost no attrition. Um, we do three camps in total, two in rural villages and one in the mid-sized city of Hyderabad where I grew up. And we reach over 120 girls between the ages of 16 and 21 years. All of them are Shia Ismaili Muslim. In terms of curriculum and pedagogy, we do everything by the book, meaning we reiterate some of the things that we had just learned in grad school. We teach our participants about transnational institutions such as the United Nations and its legal conventions. In particular, we study um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We talk in detail about the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, and enumerate the violations included in the convention. We make every effort to employ contextually relevant materials. Um, and this often meant that we selected case studies and narratives from local Sindhi and Urdu newspapers and connected them to Quranic directives to ultimately argue that the Quran advocated for women's human rights. So by all accounts, um, including pre and post surveys that we had to submit to our granting agency, the program was highly successful. We were invited to come back the following summer and we even had funding for that following summer's camp as well. However, after returning to the US, um, I began reflecting on the kinds of knowledges we emphasized during the program. And this question is important because we know from Foucault that the nexus of knowledge power produces that which is thinkable and that which is not. It produces certain subjectivities while erasing others. So it becomes important to examine the politics of educational interventions and the politics of knowledge making practices such as our camp. It seemed to me later on that we had inadvertently taken on the role of what anthropologist um, Sally Mary calls intermediaries who sit at the global local interface and translate global law into local vernacular. I have written about my reflection on the camp's knowledge making practices in an article, so I'll be brief here, but my contemplations led me to an understanding that the dominant human rights discourse has a rather specific view and a rather narrow view of what constitutes an empowered subjectivity. Often, this view is centered on an autonomous individualized subject who experiences empowerment through participating in the market and through resistance, often against one's own culture and local forms of attachment. Let me give you some examples. 
So in the camp, we positioned girls as future leaders capable of taking personal responsibility. Even the name of the camp, Women Leaders for Tomorrow, betrays our assumptions around who is responsible for producing social change in society. We did not really pay attention to the structural supports and changes that are necessary to address the violation of girls' rights. And instead, we ended up responsibilizing girls for addressing their own rights violations. We emphasized resistance as a paradigmatic expression of an empowered subjectivity. This was in contrast to notions of collaboration, solidarity, and help that the girls emphasized themselves, which I will speak about in a bit. Another example is the emphasis that we placed on girls' economic independence as a pathway to empowerment. And this, again, was not unique to our program. Many girls' empowerment programs aimed at Girls in the Global South posted the market as a crucial domain of activity through which empowerment can be achieved. However, such a logic seamlessly conflates the moral individual with the economic actor, a seamlessness that scholar Thomas Lemke notes is a feature of neoliberal rationality. Finally, our privileging of UN-centered discourses hope to introduce participants to a supranational, supracommunal code of conduct that they could leverage to discipline violators of their rights. However, an unintended consequence of this was that we not only silenced socio-ethical norms that were already circulating in the community, but also marked local attachments as possibly hindering the accomplishment of a global rights-based citizenship. Of course, the notion of a global community bodes well for the neoliberal economic order, that requires capital and labor to be mobile. However, it can also be problematic as such a global order is constructed and maintained in relation to local understandings of community. It may signal that local forms of belonging, which may be based on familial, religious, or ethnic affiliations are archaic and do not have a place in the modern social order. So in short, my reflections led me to critically examine the political work that the discourse of human rights was doing and how it erased modes of being and action that were salient in the community where I was working. Since then, I've written a range of articles that highlight the liberal humanist philosophies and Eurocentric assumptions that frame the normative rights and empowerment discourse. Um, indeed, the very constitution of human and human rights is, predicate, is predicated on assumptions about that which is not human. The discourse, therefore, has colonizing and orientalizing functions for those who have been excluded from its imaginary. More specifically, within the doctrine of humanism, only particular kinds of subjects are recognizable as human, certain forms of actions as empowering, and all else is constituted as the other or the repressed other through practices of racialization, sexualization, and naturalization. In the article that students here um, read for today, I illustrate these dynamics examining the discursive construction of two global icons of human rights advocacy, Mukhtar Amai and Malala Yousafzai, both of whom are from Pakistan. I illustrate the ways in which the public discourse around Mukhtar Amai and Malala reinscribes brown Muslim female bodies as perennially vulnerable to brown male violence. It articulates the violation of their corporeal bodies as a confirmation and as evidence of the violent propensities of their communities. And it views empowerment as individualized action against local cultures, families, and religious groups. Such knowledge making practices not only secure the continuum of human to non human, but they also re entrench the teleological narrative of liberalism, where acquisition of more rights by individuals is assumed to be the only way to secure development and emancipation. Feminist scholars, such as Inder Paul Griva, therefore view human rights as a system of truth and an ethical regime that puts into play a whole range of instrumentalizations of governance. And in the field of education, scholars such as Andre Keat have observed that human rights education is increasingly becoming a legitimizing arm of the universals produced by the liberal humanist project. 
So what we have then is a singular vocabulary of human dignity, which has ideological and material consequences for those who are excluded from or made non-existent by its imaginary. There is therefore not only a, a need to reevaluate the very terms and idioms that inform human rights advocacy, but also for exploring alternative conceptions of what it means to be human and to lead a meaningful life, worldviews that already circulate across society. This is another way to say that the task ahead of us is to decolonize and pluralize human rights. For the remaining time that I have with you today, um, I'll examine how this work of decolonizing might unfold. Um, but before doing that, I wanted to spend some time thinking about what decolonization actually means. We often think that colonialism has ended. Um, however, it may be more accurate to observe that colonial relations have not vanished. They have simply transmuted from territorial occupation to now new forms of control, exploitation, and domination. We see these new relations unfold through the expansion of global capital, the imposition of racial and religious hierarchies, soft power exercised through development agencies and human rights programs as the one I just described, and of course, the never ending war on terror. So we continue to live in a global system that organizes social life and distributes epistemic material and aesthetic resources in the service of empire. The effects of these colonial relations are visible as well. We can see them in the ever increasing global gap between the rich and the poor, the widespread displacement and dispossession of the formerly colonized, the creation of new colonies, environmental degradation, and of course, the marking of epistemologies and ontologies of the global South as inferior. Indeed, we know that territorial colonization did not just entail economic and political control. It also included cultural domination and an active erasure of indigenous knowledges. And so education has been a critical technology of empire building, and it remains so. Decolonial praxis then names a mode of intellectual reflection and action that hopes to confront colonial histories and their ongoing presences. It seeks to deconstruct dominant forms of intellectual productions to show their genealogy in Eurocentric epistemology, outline the hierarchies that emerge as a consequence, and then pluralize the knowledge field by bringing into presence epistemologies and ontologies of the global South. So let's try to attempt this in relation to Pakistan. One of the effects of the British colonial occupation of India has been the gradual displacement of prevailing understandings of knowledge and its mode of transmission. We observe an ascendancy of, quote, English schools and English knowledges, which displaced locally prevalent ideas about knowledge that often also included an esoteric dimension. For example, in some Muslim understandings, knowledge is not something that can simply be acquired at will. It is a sensibility that is tied to divine grace, that knowledge is actually bestowed. So there are complex conceptions of knowledge, including ideas about how its use has to be tied not only to self, but also societal improvement, et cetera, which have over time, been displaced as knowledge is often reduced to that which is acquired in schools, which is then tied to the market. Colonial rule has also has an effect on how religion is understood. The British, for instance, articulated their ideals of the separation of religion and state and delimited religion to the space of the family. Against this background, Islam has transformed from being a fluid lived experience to a set of ideologies and an identity. In turn, the Muslim elite have sought to emulate colonial paradigms, including educational systems, in order to remain that relevant. Scholars have named this orientation as a westward orientation, whereby a society directs attention to sources of authority outside its own. I've described these dynamics a little bit in my book as well, um, but the point I want to make here is that Contemporary forms and understandings of education in Pakistan, including its westward orientation, are conditioned by colonial logics. 
What is at stake here then is the subjugation of a society's very thought and being. Now, by speaking of knowledges and thought in this way, I don't mean to suggest that European and non-European knowledges are distinct or without any entanglement. In fact, it is precisely through practices of silencing and erasure that epistemic privilege is acquired. And that's why I often draw on Akira's use of the metaphor of ecology to conceptualize knowledge, uh, because this concept helps me to point to the historical and geopolitical conditions of knowledge making, while at the same time also attend to the nexus of knowledge and power. Practically then, to decolonize and pluralize human rights entails excavating alternate idioms and vocabularies of social justice and human dignity. This endeavor does not mean simply redefining human rights and including additional rights or grounding them in the Quran as we did, because that has the danger of making this discourse more expansive and in some ways increasing its regulatory impulse. Rather, the effort should be to point to alternate knowledge systems and modes of living where different conceptualizations of human relationality and empowerment prevail. It entails dwelling in the border spaces across epistemologies and to rewrite dominant discourses by introducing multiplicity. I'll conclude my remarks by sharing one example of what this mode of reflection might look like by returning to the same camps that I started my talk with. So at the end of the summer camp, um, my students produced a body of work. Um, these were short articles, poems, and paintings, which we collated in the form of a book. Um, you can see the image of the book on the slide here. Much of the student writing regurgitated the ideas around human rights that we had taught them, and understandably so. Therefore, there were plenty of articles on CEDA, on human Decor UN Declaration of Human Rights, et cetera. However, years later, I returned to the book to read between the lines, to read its excesses, and I discovered that border space across epistemologies that illuminated a different version of human relationality, empowerment, and sociability. It pointed to a lived reality of people, a different re reality of people, and highlighted a multiverse in which the human rights discourse convened alongside other worldviews. Specifically, since my participants were Shia Ismaili Muslims, their worldview was informed by the ethics delineated by their imam or their spiritual leader. In their writings, there appeared to be a communal code of conduct that emphasized support and collaboration. As I reread their writings, I discovered themes such as madat, help, and far's responsibility that often appeared as modes of action through which the students deprioritize their own selves in the interest of advancing communal interests. So instead of insisting on individual choice, students saw their own needs in relationship to the needs of other members of the community and oftentimes advocated for the latter. In one of the student essay, um, the ethic of madad help was invoked as a critical way for the privileged to attend to the needs of the less privileged, not as a way to rescue them, but by, but by way of sharing the resources that God had bestowed on them. So there is a hint of redistribution of resources here, which emerges from an understanding that material resources that one might have are not due to one's own performance, but given as a trust by God and hence must be shared. So this points to a form of human relationality that acknowledges the presence of a divine source, which then mediates and informs how humans are to relate with one another. Those who are marginalized in a society then were to be helped not only because they had rights, which they did, but also because the privileged had the responsibility to do so. And that responsibility emerged from a primordial commitment. Collective welfare and communal advancement thus appeared to guide individual action. Most interestingly, this notion of responsibility was also extended toward animals and the land. 
Land was not to be farmed so that it would turn barren and care was to be exhibited towards animals, including those that supported one's livelihood. And I speak about some of my encounters with members of this community in the article that students read here today as well. So in short, students often um, invoked a set of ethical relationships towards self and others that appear to sit alongside the language of personal rights and empowerment. In fact, in some cases, these ethics help students to clarify and mobilize new meanings of rights. For example, one student wrote about the right to employment. Another wrote about the right to live without poverty. So there was an entanglement in their writings, reminding us of Akira's metaphor of ecology to understand how knowledges are interconnected, much like our natural ecosystems. Exploring these um, complex intersections of knowledges means that we are attentive to the re religious moral life worlds of my students as worthy sites of knowledge production. Indeed, non-Western, non-liberal epistemologies provide a potent source of alternate framings of care for the self, community, and others. And my findings um, are not unique to the Shi'i Pakistani context. Gender studies scholars in post-socialist societies have also observed in their context too, that women relinquished certain rights in favor of broader social goods and protections, which they too desired. In such instances, women may make trade-offs that offered social stability and security at times at the expense of individual choice. And so by way of conclusion, um, I would like to leave us with a set of questions that we can discuss together. How might our worlds look like if we acknowledged and valorized multiplicities, pluralisms, a multiverse as opposed to a universe? How might such a move create space for building a cross-class and transnational alliance for social justice and human dignity? Thank you.